thrill. Yeah, let's do it. Um, I am Dr. Robinson. I'm a small animal vet in Southern California. Uh, I basically just see dogs and cats. I see the occasional rabbit um, or guinea pig or hamster or something like that. But for the most part, dogs and cats. Um, I went to Western University of Health Sciences for vet school and um, just been kind of working at the same place since I graduated and then absolutely loving it and kind of got into the Instagram world to realize with veterinary medicine, there's a lot of like misconceptions out there and ways to educate people, you know, belong besides the basic vet visit. So it's been a really cool experience, like growing my page and interacting with patients that way too. Like you guys. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a really good idea because there are so many misconceptions conceptions and we get so many questions just on random videos we post and it's so great to just like get your perspective on some of these things yeah i'm happy to help i'm excited hello everyone we have some viewers from australia in here or worldwide tonight all right (laughs) okay so uh do you want to just get into the first question yeah let's get into it okay so what are some of the most nutritious human foods to give dogs this is a big one a lot of people ask this yes so most of your vegetables and fruit are going to be okay if you think like carrots broccoli green beans celery um i tell people canned pumpkin puree you can even do blueberries blackberries raspberries pears apples um deli slices are pretty good i generally say try to do kind of non-fat everything if and you can do like non-fat yogurt, non-fat turkey, turkey deli slices, non-fat ham, um, like lean ground turkey. They're kind of the probably safest bets, depending on your, you know, yeah. basic doesn't have allergies. Things you want to avoid are um, onions, mushrooms, garlic, chives, chocolate, caffeine, uh, stuff like that. I see a lot of people say, oh, I, you know, I add um, like chicken broth to my dog's food or something like that. And I always remind people, make sure you get a dog specific one because it, mm-hmm. a lot of have like onions and garlic and chives and kind of things oh. in it are actually good for them. So, okay. That's really good to look out for. Yeah. yeah. For sure. We have so many mushrooms that grow every time it rains right in our, our oh, like boy. out back there. It's like and uh, any, anything off the ground. <laughs> Yeah, really. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, here. Pumpkin is his number one go to, though. So I could back you up on that. Highly recommend the pumpkin. Freeze it, put it in Kongs, put it on lick mats, put it in the. Yeah. Like the best. Yeah. There's a lot of cool recipes out there to use, um, like canned pumpkin and stuff, too, especially for Halloween. If you want to get a little festive, you can make your dog a a treat, too. (laughs) For sure. Tomorrow. (laughs) Yeah. Let's see. I'm checking some of the comments here. Have some allergy questions. We'll get into that a little bit later. Let's see, all right. What else we got here? What is the best age to spay and neuter a dog? So there's a lot of varying answers on this. Probably many vets will give you many different opinions, um, pros and cons to a lot of things, and it depends on the breed. In general, I tell people for like small small dogs who are under, you know, 15 pounds and you're not super worried about how their growth is going to develop. Ideally, somewhere between like six months to a year. With females, I try to do it before the first heat cycle because if you do it that way, you almost 100% eliminate their risk of getting mammary cancer. And every heat cycle you wait, that percentage goes down about 25%. Um, So for that reason, I kind of say to do it before the first heat cycle, which that can happen as early as seven months sometimes up to like a year with bigger dogs, male bigger dogs, I would suggest waiting closer to like a year, year and a half, just so they can grow appropriately. There are some studies that show they're a little more likely to have ACL tears and growth issues if you do it too early with big dogs. Now, big dogs, it's a little tough again. There are some studies with golden retrievers specifically with some cancers they're prone to. If you can wait, even for females, it's better but then you also don't get that benefit of the mammary cancer so there's you know pros and cons so i definitely would speak to your vet but that's kind of a general rule okay yeah yeah so case by case for sure have you ever heard about his like best friend it's a little beagle that he plays with at the dog park she got 
two fake pregnancies. Have you ever encountered? Yeah, that? <laughs> yeah, never heard of it. Yeah, we never heard of it. Yeah, I've seen that. Um, my grandma's dog had that. I remember growing up before I was even a vet, and she, yeah, she was taking like stuffed animals and pretending like it was for puppies and stuff. This <laughs> one, yeah, uh, where they feel like, but they're they're not actually. It's a it's a weird phenomenon. Pretty rare, but yeah, especially twice. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, 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 crazy. <laughs> have comment here from Belinda. We could just jump into some of the uh, comments. How do you feel about uh, raw food diets for dogs? So, uh, in general, I would say I'm not a fan. Some of the freeze dried stuff is okay. The stuff that's raw, if you want to go more of a fresh option, I do like the cooked stuff um like just food for dogs is really good and like the farmer's dog um i would say some dogs do great on a raw diet so i'm not gonna hate all of them but i have seen a lot probably more issues on them than not and it is a danger to you to feeding your dog a raw diet because you can get on um, like salmonella and e coli just from handling the meat or if they're licking you or you have babies or kids even like more risky for them but i've seen like chronic diarrhea uh, and stuff or blood in the or vomiting issues so again a little bit case by case and kibble gets a bad rap i think because it's kind of an advertising scheme for a lot of companies to you know feed your dog like a wolf and how they were evolved and mm-hmm. the label look nice and pretty and all that stuff so keep that in mind they're advertising to you as an owner and um they might not know the best they're just wanting to sell so i would advise your vet about that there's really bad kibbles out there there's good kibbles out there so you know it's company by company for sure okay it also seems like a lot of work like when we were getting him on a new kibble i was like tracking the k cows and adding everything up which i don't even do for myself so yeah yeah, trying to figure that out for all of the raw food as like i couldn't even imagine like yeah where to start yeah for sure i wanted to do a home cooked diet some people come into and they're like i feed you know, chicken and veggies and rice. And I kind of tell them, well, that's, you think that was balanced, but you are missing some things. Usually when you just kind of pick ingredients on your own, you'll miss like trace minerals, like say magnesium or, you know, vitamin E or something like that. So if you're interested in kind of cooking your own food, there's a website called balanceit.com. You can go on there. It's made by a vet. You can kind of put in your ingredients that you use and they'll, um, They'll tell you if you have discrepancies, like you're missing anything. And then they sell their own supplement, which I is so if you mix in, you know, like your basic vitamins and minerals and stuff in there. Balance it. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, I just wrote that down. That's what yeah. Somebody in the comments said my ex was baking a pregnancy once. So <laughs> I don't know if that really applies, but <laughs> the personal problem. We all have our problems. <laughs> okay, next question. What to use for dog teeth hygiene? So, yeah, teeth are probably the least taken care of part of a dog's body by the owners. And, like, the number one thing that I deal with in the office, we do dental cleanings mm-hmm. almost every day. And I think people are kind of like, eh, it's just their teeth. They have bad teeth. Well, that actually, it does affect their organs over time. It affects their heart, their brain. There's been studies about that, their kidneys, their liver. So, dental health is hugely important probably the number one thing that people don't do to their pets the number one thing you want to do is brush your dog's teeth like every every day if you can at least like two to three enema make sure you're getting like their back molars their teeth go really far back there especially if you have a dog under 20 pounds your yorkies your maltese's your shih tzus all those dogs are extremely prone to dental problems and will probably no matter what you do need some teeth pulled in their life unless you want to go to a veterinary dentist and get like root, root canals and stuff because as we bred them their teeth stayed the same size but their jaws got smaller so they yeah. just are really really prone to dental issues and if you can get a veterinary cleaning done once here you know we think about with us we go every six months you know and we're very on top of our dental cleaning so then when we're not as on top of it and they have more teeth than us uh, crowded teeth you know more issues so if you can get a dental cleaning once a year um cats are a little harder again if you can brush them, do it there's also dental rinses you can use and water additives for their food if you can um and if you look for the seal it says v-o-h-s 
veterinary oral health council. Um, you want to look for that if you can on the label, which means it's approved by like vet dentists to work well. Okay. Awesome. Great tips. We just took him to the vet and we would brush his teeth, but they said we have to start doing it every day because like he was getting a little bit of buildup. So now it's like every night after dinner. Yeah. Toothpaste and yeah. Yep. He's, he's it definitely took some time. And the new yacht range he was not a fan of. Yeah, yeah. I hope you know, when their puppies just start to get them used to the toothbrush, you know, when they're under six months, you're at baby teeth anyway, so it's not a huge deal, but just getting them used to it and giving them like their favorite treat after you do it and just making it like a positive experience for from when they're really young or all the help on the lawn. Oh. So. Yeah, for sure. He's getting better with it. Yeah, but she she usually brushes it. I tan it and add a lot. He's like, I can't <laughs> stick my finger in his mouth. I said, don't have to stick your finger in his mouth. Yeah. Oh, have you ever seen like those gloves that you brush with yeah. your finger? Do you recommend those or? Yeah. Those are good for cats or small mouth. It doesn't really matter what toothbrush you use. There are pet toothbrushes. There's, yeah, finger toothbrushes to get back in there a little bit more. Um, I saw someone mentioning greenies in the comment. I do like greenies on the one called CET chews that have like some enzymes. They almost look like rawhides, but there's enzymes in the bone that helps break down the tartar. Um, veggie dense is another one that's pretty good. So those are some treats too you could add in. Okay, perfect. Let's see what else we got here. This one applies to Harry. What are the best supplements for a golden doodle? So golden doodles, I would say labradoodles is probably the number one puppy I'm seeing. By the way, now everyone has to doodle. I know. I feel like it's basic. Are you basic? Yeah. <laughs> but they have, they do have such good temperament. They're so sweet. And um, the most common issues that I see with with them are like ear infections, itchiness, um, sometimes like diarrhea. Those are probably like the most common ones I see. Allergies, that kind of stuff. So kind of concentrating on those issues. I would say fish oils for their skin also helps their joints. Also just like with people, it helps with brain health, all that good stuff. Um, depending if you have a mini doodle or a bigger one, but either way, a joint supplement that has like glucosamine and joy in it, um, a good probiotics, a good one too. I like um, a company called VizBiol, V-I-S, Biol or ProViable. Um, there's also Purina has one called Fortiflora doesn't have as many um like colony forming units as other stuff do but it's really tasty and it's like a liver flavor flavored powder so that tends to be the easiest one to get the other ones are like capsules or tablets so you're kind of having to get a pill but those are okay awesome how about what to do for allergies this is a big one I feel yeah. like so many people with this problem and a lot of times he was itching and scratching. Sometimes you don't know if it's allergies or not. It's just like, big yeah. Issue. yeah. Allergies and itchy dogs are probably the, like, num maybe the number one thing that I see every day. At least a couple appointments have to do with skin. Um, so <laughs> there's a lot of different things. That it's much more complicated than it seems. So you kind of want to narrow down first type of allergies they have. So I kind of show people the three types of allergies are food, environmental, and flea allergy. So your dog can have one of those, two of those, all of those. So to narrow it down, it can be a little bit difficult. You can do to test for environmental allergy and do like a blood or a skin test. Those are pretty, pretty accurate. Um, can't just be something you order in the mail though. It has to be, you know, a legit one that your vet ordered. Oh, they tend to be fairly expensive. I know like the blood one off the top of my head, at least where I am, it costs the owners about like 500 bucks to test for everything. But they're testing like a couple hundred different things from dust to grass to all the types of trees to horses, all that kind of kind of stuff. So you can rule out that doing that. Um, some people don't want to pay for that. So you kind of assume environmental allergies are definitely the number one out of the three. Okay. Food is a little bit tougher um, the most common food allergies are chicken, beef, pork. So not grains. A lot of people about this like free diets are very common now. I actually do recommend grains. There's been some studies that some of these grain free diets have been linked to a type of heart disease in dogs. Not all of them, but some of them because they think an amino acid that um, the, that grains have that, that they add into the food, then that dog becomes deficient in it and it causes thinning. 
So you want grain in there, usually it's the protein that they're allergic to. What you have to do is do a food trial. So you have to get them on a prescription. Um, it's called a hydrolyzed protein diet where they break down the, the protein so much that they can't have a reaction to it. So you get them on that food. It has to be ordered from a vet. Unfortunately, it's prescription. Um, the way it's made, they clean out all the machinery and stuff before they make the bag so that there's no like traces of chicken or beef. So you can't go pick like a duck diet or something like that. Cause you're not 100% sure that, you know, they did their due diligence to clean everything. Mm -hmm. And them to that food for two to three months. And you see at the end of it, is there other allergies like better, same or worse? And then you kind of decide based off that if there are allergic or not. So there's no test for food allergy, unfortunately. No blood test, no saliva test accurate. There's tons of false positives. So veterinary dermatologists don't recommend those. And then fleas, a little bit harder. You can do a blood test for that. But in general, most dogs should be on flea and tech medication pretty much every month. So just keep them on that. So that's not even an issue. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. There's a lot of misconceptions that you address there. So first, yeah, totally. I see. I hope everybody has their pen that's <laughs> watching this right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What to do for yeast? So yeast kind of goes along with allergies. So what happens is the dog itchy and they kind of chew and scratch at themselves. So then the normal skin like microbiome, you have bacteria and, and yeast and stuff on your skin. If they're if the barrier is disrupted by chewing or scratching or allergies, then either the yeast or the bacteria start overgrowing and then you get an infection on top of it. So a lot of people, you know, will ask, well, how my dog's itchy? What do I do? And yeah, there's some stuff that can help, but first you want to rule out, is there an infection present? Because then despite what you do, bathing, you know, pills, whatever, it's not going to work until you address the underlying infection first. That makes them more itchy. So for yeast specifically, you can determine if they have yeast infection by um, kind of like scraping the skin and looking at it under a microscope. See if you see yeast or bacteria. For either one, there's kind of specific oral medications you can do. Bacteria, obviously biotics, yeast, you'd kind of go with antifungals. Um, bathing routinely helps with yeast with a medicated shampoo. Um, so you want to see like antifungal on the label. I like one, pretty sure it's prescription, so you have to get it from your vet, but it's um, called Meconahex plus Triz. So it's like a medicated shampoo. You bathe them, kind of let it sit for, you know, 15 minutes or so, and then rinse it off and do that for like four to six weeks. Um, sometimes Depending if they don't have a food allergy, there are just like dermatology diets that help where they have like added fish oils and anti-inflammatories and stuff in there to help with itching a little bit too. So okay. either yeast. Yeah. Excellent. I think I saw like a super comment in here real quick. Yeah. I don't know. It's got three hearts. So <laughs> um, do you have a suggestion for flea and tick treatment? shots, pills, collars, spray, et cetera, anything? Yes. Yeah, so fortunately, anything that's not prescription really doesn't work that great. So I've seen dogs and cats come in on um, stuff that's over the counter, like Frontline or Advantage, stuff that's been around a long time that unfortunately fleas have grown immune to. So we doesn't really work for. Um, there are different stuff for like your home that you can treat. Like flea busters is a good one where you kind of, you know, put it on your carpet and vacuum it up. Um, there's flea shampoo, which I recommend as far as like prescription ones that I like. There's tons out there. So every vet kind of has different pharmacy, but you do need to get it from your vet. I personally use one called NexGuard for my dog. Um, Burbecto is a good one too. There's a, some Perica Trio is a newer one that's been going around. Um, Trifexis is another one. It's a little bit older. So there's a lot of different ones. I'd kind of just ask your vet which one they have in stock and I'm sure it'll work. A lot of them have the same ingredients, different kind of combinations of stuff. Okay, cool. How about um, the flea collars that are like essential oil based? I don't, I don't really think they work. Okay. Yeah. Um, oils it seems more realistic but it can be a little toxic depending how much they put in it so oh not all are, are good for dogs too yeah okay. you know, it's very good to know yeah and the oh, fleet right. call love in general i don't think they work that great okay all right harry throw on your fleet collar out <laughs> so be happy to hear that. <laughs> yeah. all right do you recommend blood allergy tests we kind of got to that 
bit. Um, what breed of dog should people know is for experienced dog owners? Um, so it's kind of a loaded question because I personally think in back dogs of every breed and, and you know, I've seen like the nicest breeds even bite people before. So I would just say do your do your research before you get a dog. Kind of know how much you're willing to commit to that breed. Um, ones that tend to be a little more difficult, ones that are going to be, you know, kind of more stubborn side, really high energy, tend to be really independent, um, kind of a little more dominant. And obviously their size, generally bigger dogs are a little bit harder and require more um, of your time than a little dog might. So in general, breeds like, you know, Husky, the Kitas, Chows, um, Border Collies, Australian Shepherd, German Shepherd, Rottweilers, Dobermans, like Belgian Malinois, different types of pit bulls, um, cattle dogs, things like that for kind of the reasons that I mentioned. Oh, he had a cattle dog. It, I, I hear crazy stories about that dog. Yeah, and he kept this on yeah. too. He would like herd us while we yeah. fight his kids, which was great for him. But in the snow, he would like come up and come onto our backs and like push us face first into the spell. That was a fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, we had him for close to 20 years. So yeah, the lot and grew up with him. Yeah, the longest living dog, I believe, was tw like 27 and it was an Australian cattle dog. Wow, I believe it. <laughs> very independent and they're insanely smart but they're just they're kind of a one person dog and they'll be so devoted and loving to you but they're they're definitely not the best for people who don't know about the breed and <laughs> yeah. yeah a lot of walks had to be taken every day <laughs> <laughs> you want to think about what they were bred for you know when you're getting a dog because obviously with them, they were bred to herd cattle and be running all day. And yuck, he sat herding them, nipping at their heels, that kind of thing. So yeah. keep that in. Right. Yeah, it makes sense. Wow, 27 yeah. years. That's wild. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> Good. Good. That's you. <laughs> okay, next question is best breeds for families and kids that tend to be easier to deal with. Are there any particularly easy, low-maintenance dogs? Yeah. I do think your doodles are, are pretty good and um, they don't tend to have too many like behavioral issues. They obviously require walks and runs and stuff, but nothing too crazy. So those are good labs. Um, if you want a big dog, they're fairly easy and good for families, but still require exercise. And then your little dogs like Yorkies, Papanese, Shih Tzus, Greyhounds, Cavaliers, um, bigger dogs, sometimes like Collies are fairly easy. Bo boxers are kind of high energy, but good family dogs too. So, okay, awesome. Just gonna check the comments real quick. Everybody's waving. If you guys are enjoying this, make sure to follow both of us, and you know maybe we'll do this again in the future. Oh. Uh, getting a lot of good insight and questions answered. All right, let's see what else here. Oh, we kind of addressed that one. Joint supplement recommendations for older dogs. Yes. So any big dog, uh, they're basically considered seniors. I would say a dog over 50 pounds is considered a senior already when they're like seven or eight. So getting them on a joint supplement, you know, even like at five years old is a good idea. Generally, the best ones are going to include fish oils, glucosamine and chondroitin in them. So there's a lot of different ones that the ones that I feel are the most effective brands, at least one's called Phycox with a P. Dasequin is a good one. Cosequin uh, is a good one. And then, yes, I would add in like fish oil to them too. Probiotics are a good one to keep them healthy. There are different like senior vitamins. There's a company called Vetra Science that has um, senior vitamins for dogs. So stuff like that. And also getting them on a senior diet as well. So whatever brand you use, just switch them over to the senior formula when they're like eight or nine. Okay. Excellent. Thanks. So next we have opinions on anxiety meds for dogs. So anxiety is a really tough topic and it's one that I'm seeing a lot after COVID because animals were so used to being home and so many people got animals during COVID and now they're going back to work and it's really hard on them. So if it's mild, I mean, I would probably start with just working with a trainer on kind of how to change 
or behavior to help with the anxiety. For instance, dogs can get really triggered by when you leave. So say like my dog, whenever I put on my jacket or grab my keys, she's like, oh, where are we going? Where are we going? So she just associates that. So it's little things that you want to uncouple their response to that with. So just grabbing your keys randomly or putting your shoes on and not going anywhere. They don't get as stressed or leaving just for a couple minutes and then coming home. So I would start with working with a trainer who has experience working with dogs with anxiety. And then as far as supplements go, I've seen a a lot of people ask me about CBD for various issues like seizures or anxiety or uh, pretty much anything, pain. In general, we aren't really allowed to get, at least in California, recommend certain CBD products. So I can't really say that, but I would say 50% of people probably notice a difference and 50% don't. If you want to try that, I would say just make sure it has zero THC and do research on the company that you get it from. But some people have seen some help, you know, with that. And then other ones are more, there are some over-the-counter ones, ones called Zylkeen, Z-Y-L-K-E-N-E. That's a good supplement. There are some prescription diets that are have Calm in the name, uh, like Royal Canin, Science Diet, Purina of Pro Plan, I think they, at least two out of three of those have a Calm diet. So they add stuff in there like tryptophan and things to help with anxiety. I feel like it works a little bit better in cats and dogs, but right. something that and there's obviously like three to five prescription medications that you can try to even and you'd have to get them from your vet and talk to them about it. Usually you kind of pick a dose, try it for 30 days, see how it's going and then adjust, you know, increase it if you need to. Um, I would say with that, I even still tell people try to work with a veterinary trainer or behaviorist if you can as you're doing that because you kind of want to do a combination of both. Just the meds, maybe people say it helps half the time so it's just it's tough there's no nothing that i'm like this works if you get it you know everything's cured it's unfortunately kind of a bit more complicated and takes a lot of work on your end so it's tough okay at least you know there are some behavioral type options as well as the medication so yeah i feel like most people just think cbd or meds first yeah. so yeah yeah all right got some uh, comments here Samra or Ramirez, sorry if I butchered the name. What dental treats slash shoes or supplements do you recommend? You said greenies were a good one. Yeah, green and C E T chew, C period, E period, T period, um, and veggie dent. Those are probably like my three favorite ones. Okay. There's also I forgot to mention there's a prescription um dental diet that apparently the um, it's why I tell science diet and in Canada, the number one prescription diet that's sold in Canada and here we kind of forget about it, but it works by, it's a really big kibble and it would be a good option for dogs really prone to dental issues like Yorkies and Chihuahuas and little dogs under 10 pounds. And it helps get the tartar off the teeth as they chew and they've done studies that it, it does really help. So that's what I'm Oh, wow. It's made to be like used lifelong. Excellent. What was that called? It's called T T slash D, and it's by Hill Science Diet. Okay, awesome. And we have, should small dogs get fish oil? Yeah, I would say all dogs can benefit from fish oil unless they have allergy. You have to be a little careful with fish oil because if you just add it in all of a sudden a huge dose, they might get diarrhea or upset stomach. So kind of want to slowly add it in. I usually would say for like skin issues and stuff, go like 20 milligrams per pound if you can. Um, okay. So, you know, say your dog weighs 40 pounds, basically times that by 20 and that's how much you should use per day, but slowly get up to that dose. So, and if they get diarrhea, cut back and kind of get as close as you can to that. Okay, perfect. Next question is recommendations for itchy paws. So, I mean, that kind of goes along with the whole allergy discussion. Chewing paws is probably the number one symptom I see with allergies. There are prescription medications and injections that help with itchy paws if it's really bad. Like I was talking about first, you want to rule out infection. So I would go see your vet about it first just to have them actually look at the paws. Um, But there is an injection for allergies that helps with itch called Cytopoint that you can get. There's obviously steroids you can use that really help, but they're not meant for term there's another prescription method 
called Apoquil that we use pretty frequently for itchy paws and just itchiness in general. And then if you want to try something without going to your vet, I would say wipe, just wiping down their paws when they come in from a walk just to get some of the stuff off, just with like a wet washcloth. There's also different, um, almost like makeup pads. They come in a little container, but you can kind of wipe their paws down with that. It's like a medicated wipe. Um, you can't try antihistamines first, like dogs can have Zyrtec and Benadryl. Um, so you, I'd say it probably helps maybe 20% of the time. So it's not great, but it's something you could try before having to go to your vet. Okay. What do you recommend for dogs resting their chins on uh, the island? <laughs> Ridiculous, dude. <laughs> Here. Boy. Yep. Hat always has to be on you, not near yeah. you. <laughs> All right. Almost there are all the questions here. If you guys have more, make sure to comment them. Uh, the next one is long-term effects of Apoquil, the med you just mentioned. Oh, yeah. So like any medication, I mean, there can be some side effects. Unfortunately, we don't have... I would say the injection called Cytopoint is a little safer than Apoquil. You do it every one, once every one to two months to help with itchiness. Apoquil, there's been some studies that show if they have an underlying cancer present, it can make it worse. So people really freak out about that. But there's not really been any long-term studies that say 100%. Those, those see it in most of the time people are like, oh, my dog's on Apoquil. And then they get cancer and they assume that the Apoquil from the cancer when really it could be just genetics and stuff. So, um, but if you are going to be on Apoquil, I do recommend, and Apoquil basically works. You give it one to two times a day. It works by helping with itch and then also helps with inflammation. So um, it does work. It's been around a while. It's, it's very frequently used for allergies. Um, but I do say try to get blood work routinely if you're on it just to check a little bit. It can cost like 1% of the time cost some bone marrow suppression. So keeping an eye on their white blood cell count and stuff like that. Okay. But sometimes they're a rock in a hard place. Dogs can be miserable with itchiness and, you know, if it's, it might be worth it even with the rest sometimes so right right okay will neutering calm my dog down this is for everyone that just thinks their dog is bad because they're not neutered yet it, uh, maybe it's i can't 100 percent might might help a little bit but it could just be your breed or your dog too it's hard to say okay i do girl i missed it what'd you say I said, I do recommend neutering just in general, regardless of behavioral problems or not, unless you're planning to to breed them. Gotcha. All right. Any tips for new dog owners related to health and safety? Um, I do have a reel on my Instagram page towards the end about new puppies and kittens and kind of basics on what you should know probably applies to new just pets in general, not necessarily puppies. Um, but I would try to visit your vet ASAP. I mean, they can go over a lot of stuff with you, you know, within like the first week that you have them. There's different vaccines you want to get. I usually check for parasites so that kind of first round. Talk to them about possibly getting pet insurance, which I recommend highly. Uh, and, and I would just, again, do your research about the breed that you're going to get. Go to puppy classes, dog classes, things like that initially. Get them, you know, really socialize with different people, different dogs and um, annual vet visits for sure. Okay, perfect. Uh, last question on the list here is thoughts on multiple vaccines at one time. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Little dogs, I usually don't because it's just a lot for their body to handle because you get the same dose of the vaccine depending if the dog's small or big. In rare, rare circumstances, it can your dog can get a vaccine reaction and that's more likely if they get more vaccines at once so there's no downside to splitting them up so might as well split them up so i would it okay. sometimes there are very weird immune mediated issues where the body kind of like attacks itself but that's extremely rare okay cool we're through all the uh questions from all the followers that you guys asked all week so Go through the chat here. Belinda asked, is there a reason dogs eat cat poop? So sometimes dogs will eat either cat poop, dog poop, their own poop. Um, 
there's different things you can do for that. Sometimes it can be a sign of a nutritional deficiency where you might want to look at their diet and just make sure sometimes it can be related if they have a parasite. So get their fecal checked, make sure they don't have parasites because that can take some of their nutrition and make them want to eat stuff. Sometimes it it can start as that issue and then just become a learned behavior and they just like the taste of it, which is really nasty. (laughs) There's a supplement called um, Forbid that you can give to the animal's poop that they're eating and then they are supposed to smell it in that poop and not want to eat it. Another thing you could do is sometimes you can put like hot sauce or vinegar on the poop when it's out. <laughs> yeah, fla- you got to flavor the poop, you know? Yeah. You got to ranzy, Chef Ranzi that a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> eat that again. So little things you could try. <laughs> That's funny. That reminds me, we had to get his paw wrapped. He got like a little puncture and they sprayed yeah. the wrap with, I don't know, some kind of fur bit. Yeah, some sour. Yeah. And he loved it. He was like, oh, I love this stuff. <laughs> okay. I've uh, yet to find something he won't try to eat. Oh, that's funny. Must be the color. He's a double doodle. So golden okay. and labradoodle. Yep. Okay. I'd be more of the lab and him then. They tend to eat everything in sight. <laughs> right. It's getting better. But it, it, the first year, I was like pulling my hair out from the day we brought him home. He was yeah. a, like mulch, and I was like, you "Can't you just can't eat it? Like, it's it's not okay to eat, and it ta- it has to not taste that great. Like you're eating wood. Like, it's crazy. <laughs> okay, we'll we'll wait a couple seconds here, see if anybody has some last okay. minute questions. Thank you for joining. So, tell us about your dog. You said you have a dog, right? Yes, yeah, she's she sounds her sleeping. She's fourteen, and I found her as a puppy when she was. I found her as a puppy when I was like, years ago, and now she's fourteen. So she comes with me to work like almost every day. In my office. She sleeps a lot of the time because she's a little older, but she has no issues. She has arthritis, but she's still trucking along and doing really well. She's like a boxer Rhodesian mix. She's like fifty pounds. Oh, so, uh, her name is Jeff. Yeah, she has a vet for a month, so of course she has no issues. Yeah, anything that pops up or weird, I'm like, pop, what's happening? Full, full blood panel, full, I do that I do that too, I just don't have the tools for it. And so, he had like a little lump on him right after we went to the vet a few months ago, and I was like, oh my god, he has a lump on him, we have to get him to the vet. And like, I called, and they're like, yeah, but we just gave him like, two shots there like wait like three days and so I didn't go down I was like okay but for that can be down I'm coming right in like they, they definitely have like my picture up in the vet's office and it's like this crazy dog mom watch out for her but he... this one might be more training based but how can I stop unwanted barking I don't know if you have any thoughts on that one um so yes I mean the majority is going to be training uh Sometimes that can be related to pent up energy. Make sure your dog is physically and mentally stimulated. There's different like, interactive toys you can get them when you're gone just to kind of keep them distracted and also taking them like on walks and runs if they are like a high energy breed because they could just have some like pent up energy that they're releasing. That being said, a lot of little a lot of little dogs and some big dogs are just prone to barking. And um, there's vibration collars that can help. There's also something called a citronella collar where they bark and it kind of releases this spray that's like not supposed to smell or taste good. And that can help. So, but yeah, we're in dinner. Okay. I never heard about that. That's, yeah. that's yeah. kind of cool. Okay. Awesome. Um, Let's see. My spaniel eats long-lasting treats within minutes. Is this normal? That sounds like Harry. Yeah. <laughs> Love food. <laughs> yeah. My dog loves getting the butt scratch. So does Harry. That's normal. <laughs> All right. I mean, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Uh, like I said, everybody, make sure you follow Dr. Robinson. She's been a gem, answered so many questions for us. Hopefully we can do this again. Is there anything you want to say or anywhere you want to lead people to, to, you know? Yeah, I have a, a TikTok and obviously this Instagram that I'm on right now. So check that out. I try to post on there, you know, tips and tricks and stuff like that. And feel free to reach out with your questions. I try to respond. Sometimes I'll just say, go 
go talk to your vet because obviously I can't give a medical diagnosis with just you telling me, but I'm happy to try to help. Yeah, this has been awesome. I definitely, let's do it again for sure. Yeah, for sure. All right. Say bye-bye, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> He's a sleepy head over here. Yeah. Oh.